The Palestinian terrorist group Hamas has been accused of kidnapping three Israeli boys. In turn, Hamas and Fatah threaten Israel with force. Sunni Islamic jihadists take over Sunni territory in Iraq. In turn, Iraqis tell ISIS, bring it on, we've dug your graves. Iraq requests United States airstrikes against Sunni militants. Iran refuses a deal that will limit their nuclear program. Iran's supreme leader says jihad, that's holy war, will continue until America is no more. He says that the Islamic Messiah is coming to kill all infidels. Friends, the Middle East is a powder keg like it has never been before. I haven't even touched on what's going on in U Ukraine and Russia, what's going on in Egypt. Like never before have I seen headlines like this, and I think anyone else who has studied Bible prophecy for decades knows it's never been like this. This is the acceleration of the final events that Bible prophecy speaks about. In Israel, the search for the missing Israeli teens has turned into a military and diplomatic campaign against Hamas. The ongoing search for three Israeli teens who may have been kidnapped in the occupied West Bank has expanded far beyond its initial scope, quickly transforming into a full-scale military and diplomatic effort to crush Hamas. This could get worse by the minute. Terrorist organizations in Gaza condemn IDF operation to free kidnap teens. They say racist occupier, that's Israel, only understands force. Terrorist organizations in Gaza, including Hamas and Fatah's Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade faction, threatened on Tuesday that they would take action if Israel continues its crackdown on the Hamas terror infrastructure in Judea and Samaria. Commenting on the IDF operation seeking to rescue the three Israeli teens kidnapped by Hamas terrorists last Thursday, the terrorist groups declared that the IDF would fail to break the willpower of the Palestinian resistance. Joel Rosenberg says, Chaos in Iraq and Syria setting stage for the 12th Imam, says Ayatollah, but more must be done. Iranian leader reveals thoughts on Shia eschatology. What you need to know is that the Muslims are split into two main groups, the Shiites and the Sunnis. It is the Sunnis that are ISIS. ISIS stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and they are uh, a faction of Al-Qaeda. They want to take over Iraq for themselves. However, Iraq is, Sunni ter is uh, Shiite territory, and so this is turning into a civil war. What are the end times implications of the enormous upheavals we're seeing in Iraq and Syria? The highest ranking Shia Muslim leader in the world believes events in the epicenter are preparing the way for the soon arrival of the so-called Islamic Messiah, the 12th Imam. Shia leaders, and especially the leaders of Iran, are trying to actively accelerate his arrival by gaining control of Iraq and Syria and preparing for the annihilation of Israel and the United States. This week the Ayatollah Khomeini revealed his latest thinking on the subject. Iran's supreme leader is promising a world free of infidels and non-believers with the coming of the Islamic Messiah, Mahdi, a ninth century descendant of the prom Prophet Muhammad whom the Shiites refer to as the twelfth Imam. Iran's clerical rulers believe the figure Saeed Khorasani, who at the end of times facilitates the coming and passes the flag of Islam to Imam Mahdi, is the current supreme leader of the regime, Ayatollah Khomeini. The Obama administration is currently engaged in intensive negotiations over the regime's illicit nuclear and missile programs. Iran insists on the right to enrichment and the expansion of nuclear research and development, but international analysts believe the goal is to acquire nuclear weapons to use against Israel and the United States. Don't be fooled by this man. This is Iran's newest president, Rouhani. Remember Mahmoud Ahmadinejad seemed like a crazy man saying that he was sent by the 12th Imam to wipe Israel off the map. He's no longer in power anymore. This man came to power and the Western media said he was a moderate and he wasn't like 
Mahmud Ahmadinejad. The opposite is the truth. This man is more of a deceiver. He's much more subdued in his, in his rhetoric. But Iran's newly elected president, Hassan Rouhani, attributed his victory in June uh, to the 12th Imam Mahdi, a statement with ominous overtones in the Islamic regime's quest for nuclear weapons. The Shiites believe that at the end of times, the 12th Imam, a 9th century prophet, will reappear with Jesus Christ at his side, kill all the infidels, and raise a flag of Islam in all four corners of the world. Many analysts believe Iran is seeking nuclear capability to bring on that Armageddon. In my opinion, these Muslims are totally satanic. They are indwelt with many legions of demons. And what they're doing is trying to take over the world. They want to post their flag on all four corners of the world. We read in Bible prophecy at the end there will be a world leader who comes on, the scene, comes on the scene in the name of peace, but he turns out to be a man of war, hell-bent on conquest, on conquering. Revelation 6 says that when the first seal breaks, a rider on the white horse comes out, bent on conquest. This may be the Mahdi. Christians know him as the Antichrist. Well, the Muslims believe this is the time that he will be revealed. The Muslims believe that the people who are in power right now are the very people who will bring him into power. I believe that's possibly accurate. Because all the signs that I've been showing on this channel for years and years show that we are also we are living in those last days. We Christians believe the same thing. These are the last days. However, we don't know exactly how it's all going to play out. And we have to watch daily. We're called to watch. Most importantly, we're called to watch for our Savior to return. In the same way that these, are ret these Arabs, these Muslims are looking for their Savior to return. Everyone's looking for the Messiah. And that's why when the Antichrist rises to power, the world's going to buy it. And they'll take his mark or they'll be beheaded. This is a one-world religion, as well as a one-world government, which will operate on a one-world economy. And we're living in those days. It's coming, and it's coming fast. Personally, I'm having a hard time reading and keeping up on all the articles, everything that's going on right now. It's very difficult, because it's happening faster than ever. And I think all eschatologists will agree it's happening extremely fast. Breakneck speed. We're headlong into the final wars. Psalm 83 is at our heels. The destruction of Damascus, Isaiah 17, I believe is part of that. And rapidly following that, I believe the Gog-Megog war, which involves Iraq and her ally, or I'm sorry, Iran and her ally, Russia, who are also threats major threats. They will come and take a spoil in the Ezekiel 38-39 war against Israel. But Israel is going to come against a major attack soon. But they'll win. They're not going to lose. And they're going to take most of the territory from these groups in the Psalm 83 war. And then in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the remaining Enemies of Israel will attack once again to take a spoil. These wars are coming and they're coming fast. And if you have never believed that the Bible was true, literal, you've got to open your eyes and recognize that this is it. This is it. It is here. It's upon us right now. And if you do not have your faith in the true Messiah, who died, was buried, and was raised again, defeating death by his Father, then you're in a world of trouble. Because it's only through his death and his resurrection, the shedding of his blood and his defeating of death, that you can defeat death. It's a matter of faith.
you need to put your faith in him. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach, well known as Jesus Christ. He is the true Messiah, not the twelfth Imam, not the Mahdi, and no one else. If you're hearing these words and if you're being touched by what you hear and what you see, it's time. It's time for you to accept Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, as your Lord and Savior. Give your life to Him and get saved. Because the world events are rapidly, rapidly coming to a close. And you don't have the promise of tomorrow. And once you take your last breath, the decision has been made. Not making a decision is your decision. A most unfortunate one. On my website, erfministries.com, you can learn why I know that I need a Savior. I'll walk you through what the Bible says about this. Also, these two purple videos will do the same. If you have questions about salvation or if you need prayer for yourself, click the prayer button, fill out the form, and someone from the ERF Ministries team will get back to you to help you through these things. Highly recommended, and it's free for you. There are many good people in the Middle East, not just demon-possessed madmen. There are good people who have turned their lives over to the truth, to the true Messiah. And there are good people who are searching for Him. There are people who have to leave their homes because of these civil wars, because of these skirmishes. There are so many people who are innocent and get picked off. Please, please pray for these people. They're just living in a bad area. It's not their fault. And pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May she always prevail. PA President Mahmoud Abbas openly tells his Palestinian officials that his strong words against Hamas terror activities are meant to trick the Americans. They're basically lying. In Islam, they have a term for lying, takia. Look it up. It's okay to lie in Islam to promote your own agenda. Well, it's no wonder because the one they worship, Allah, brags about being the greatest deceiver of all in the Quran. Hmm. Yeah, they say we don't negotiate with terrorists, but we've been doing that for three decades, starting with Yasser Arafat. Proverbs 13.20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the compassion of fools will be destroyed. Or, or the companion of fools. The companion of fools will be destroyed. Hmm... We need to wake up, people. Ah. <laughs> We've got the Sunnis against the Shiites. We've got Hamas. You know, they all hate Israel. But within the groups of the Muslim factions that are there, a lot of them hate each other. You know, Iraq was in civil war in 2006, 2007, but the U.S. troop surge kind of restored a stability at the time. But then Obama withdrew all the troops at the end of 2011, and now this Sunni group, ISIS, is taking over much of Iraq, has taken over parts of Syria, and it's moving across the land like a plague, taking the spoils of war as it moves, taking cash, gold, weapons, tanks, banks, prisons, letting all the prisoners loose. People, I think we need to keep a close eye on this because this is Bible prophecy unfolding in front of our face. At the very time this, this hateful 
killing machine of terrorists is, is going along the banks of the Euphrates River. At the very same time, the Euphrates River is drying up. Again, let me point out, there are no coincidences with God. This is all happening at the same time for a reason. They're, they're beheading their own brethren, their own Muslim brothers. Thousands of decapitated victims are lining the roads in Iraq. Thousands have been executed. Mm. This is just going to continue to grow until somebody goes in, steps in, and actually does something. You know, Obama sent 300 people that aren't going to be in combat. They're just going to be advisors. You know, so what are they going to do? I think Obama and his whole team of negotiators are probably some of the worst negotiators ever in United States history. And I think the biggest reason why is because Obama clearly said who he would stand with in his book. He said he'd always stand with the Muslim people. The Muslim people. Not the American people. Not the Christian people. Certainly not the Jewish people. But the Muslim people. I'm curious. Is, is Obama Sunni or Shiite? I, I think I looked into that one time and knew the answer, but it's been several years. Um, so, what do we do? You know, we, we had Iraq under control, so we thought, oh, let's pull all the troops out, and then whoo, the vacuum created by American troops leaving is now filled by Muslims killing each other. Hmm. Uh, you know... Obama has effectively encouraged America's enemies to target other Americans because they think we'll pay ransom for it. Obama's willing to work with terrorist organizations. Hamas, the Taliban. You know, American law, United States law prohibits the American government from funding or even cooperating with recognized terrorist groups. The U.S. State Department has declared it sees no problem in supporting the new Palestinian unity government consisting of Fatah and Hamas, terrorist groups. Is that not treason? Is he not breaking our own laws? Clinton was impeached for fooling around with a girl. What's it going to take for Obama to be kicked out of office? It was Winston Churchill. Do a little Google search. Do a little digging, investigating. He basically drew the map of the modern Middle East as we know it today. Winston Churchill. One time he said about the nation of Jordan that he created it with the stroke of a pen on a Sunday afternoon in Cairo just kind of drew these arbitrary lines of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. You know, if you read the Bible about the description of the land of Israel, uh, where is that, like Genesis 15, I believe? Somewhere in Genesis. Um, it talks about all the way to the Euphrates River. Euphrates River, that's in Iraq. A lot of people are always blaming Israel for taking someone else's land. Let me just remind you, if you read the description of the size of Israel from the Holy Bible, it's more like the size of Texas, not the size that it currently has, which equals about the size of the state of New Jersey. This little strip of land. It should be much bigger. So, who really stole whose land? Just curious. It's in the Bible. Don't blame the messenger. I'm just delivering truth from God's word. The land of Israel should be about ten times bigger than it is. Should include parts of Saudi Arabia, parts of Syria, parts of Iraq. Okay? Parts of Lebanon. Hmm. Churchill created a time bomb that we have to deal with now. Wow. Wow. 
The PA President Mahmoud Abbas openly tells his Palestinian officials that his strong words against Hamas terror activities are meant to trick the Americans. They're basically lying. In Islam, they have a term for lying, takiyah. Look it up. It's okay to lie in Islam to promote your own agenda. Well, it's no wonder because the one they worship, Allah, brags about being the greatest deceiver of all in the Quran. Hmm. Yeah, they say we don't negotiate with terrorists, but we've been doing that for three decades, starting with Yasser Arafat. Proverbs 13.20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the compassion of fools will be destroyed. Or, or the companion of fools. The companion of fools will be destroyed. Hmm. We need to wake up, people. We need to wake up. Acts 28.24 says, And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. You know, there's never been a crossbreed between a believer and an unbeliever. You're either dead in Christ or you're alive in Christ. Oh, dead without Christ would probably be the more proper use. There's no neutral ground. There's no, there's no lukewarm. There's no sitting on the fence. You're either with Christ or you're against him. Period. You're one or the other. If you're neutral, then you're against him. Just saying. You either have to be on the side with those who are alive in Christ or on the other side with those who are dead and condemned to hell. You can't waver between the two opinions. Ah, people who think they're going back and forth between two opinions are really of one opinion, okay, if you think about it. They do not intend to serve the Lord. Um, and they say in their hearts, who is this Lord that I should serve him? Hmm. People have a problem with service, with humility. Humility is not uh, highly favored in the world as we know it. Um, being a, an arrogant, proud, braggadocious, egotistical fool is, is more highly favored in the world. Sad what we're teaching kids these days. Here's something, though. Try this. Take a pen and paper. Sit down. And think honestly and openly. Examine your heart and see where you are in regards to God. Weigh your own condition before the Lord. Write down one of these words, okay? If you feel like you're not a believer, write down the word condemned. Jesus said, if you don't believe in the only begotten Son of God, you're condemned already. Condemned already. That's an awful state to be in. But if you're a believer in Jesus, if you believe him to be the Son of God, he is. God in flesh that he clearly is. The Savior of the world, the Messiah that was prophesied, the King of kings. If you believe upon Jesus, then write down this word. Forgiven. You're either condemned or you're forgiven. There's no other words. One of those two. Be honest with yourself. Be honest before God. Write down which one you believe you fall under. And if you wrote down the word condemned, Let me give you some encouragement. God loves you. God doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. It's not too late. There's still hope for you. If you wrote down condemned, get on your knees and ask God to forgive you of your sins. 
and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved, Romans 10 verse 9 says. If you wrote down the word condemned, and you prayed to God to forgive you of your sins, and you invited Jesus Christ to be your Lord, Savior, and King, take that paper, tear it up, light it on fire, scratch it out, do what you need to do, be safe about it, and then write down the word forgiven. <laughs> Because when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're forgiven of all your sins. Your sins were taken upon, taken upon Jesus on the cross. He paid the price that you should pay for your sins. So when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus on you. Because your sins were placed on him. Oh... This isn't a game. This, this is a matter of spiritual life and death. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong, and this also we wish even your perfection. Hmm. Hmm. Let God examine you and show you your real, your real spiritual position. Go to Psalm 26, verse 2. It says, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. We should be like Elijah. You know, Elijah's name literally means Yahweh is my God. He, he was a very active prophet in Israel. In the middle, in in the the middle of the ninth century B.C., you know his main work was to combat Baal worship, okay, and, and restore the worship of the true God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Kind of like Moses, he stood against the false gods of Egypt and the oppression of Pharaoh. Elijah was a prophet who stood against the worship of Baal at great risk to himself. Okay, and now picture the scene here. He was, he was defying Ahab and Jezebel, okay? Israel's royal couple, the ones in charge, the authorities of the day. And he was trusting God to take care of him in his life when he was threatened by famine and violence. He stood against them. I was on top of Mount Carmel when I was in Israel. I saw the very place where Elijah called down fire from heaven. If you've never read it in 1 Kings 17 through 19 or so, here are these people worshiping a false god, Baal. They're, they're cutting themselves. They're, they're, they're in this like demonic cult worship. And here's Elijah calling them out. You know, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And then they had this little contest. They said, okay, you, you make your altar, call upon your God, and I'll call upon my God. We'll see who answers. So the worshipers of Baal, they, you know, they're, they're screaming and yelling and chanting and cutting themselves and, and doing all this ritualistic stuff. No answer, no response. Elijah's like kind of taunting them. He's like, uh, your God must be sleeping. Or, or maybe he's hard of hearing. He can't hear you. Hey, scream louder, you know. Do what you got to do over there. Um, I, I'm not seeing anything. You guys see anything? Is he invisible? Yeah, I don't know. And then Elijah built this altar, put a bunch of wood on the altar, and then took three giant barrels of water. Said, soak the wood. Soak the wood. You know, fill the trenches up. 
Make sure it's it's not real flammable, okay? Let's make this difficult. Let's put God to the test. Well, he didn't say that. But he was. I mean, let's face it. He put God to the test. And then he called for his God to rain down fire upon this. It burned with a mighty flame. Even the trenches filled with water set there flaming. Powerful. Okay. Here's Elijah speaking against the false gods of his day. Standing on the truth of God's word. We need to emulate him very strongly today because there's a lot of people following after a false god in this world. A lot of people. Christianity is the biggest religion on the face of the earth, but Islam is second. And they're following after a false god. People, we need to stand up and lead these people out of the dark cave their cult was born in and into the light of truth that is Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, God in flesh, Savior of the world, the Messiah that was prophesied, the King of kings. Every knee will bow before him, I promise you. We need to stand up, be bold, be strong, be like Elijah. Don't be afraid of what man may do to you because you speak against their false god they worship, one who brags about being a great liar. You know, people like to think sometimes of these prophets of old like they were some kind of superhuman strength people. They were, they were these fanatics that had the power of God in their hand. They were thundering speeches every time they spoke. They were some kind of amazing, beyond anything human kind of people. Nope. They were just like us. They were just like us. Same God yesterday, today, and forever. God can still use people the same way he used Elijah. Open yourself up to God. Make yourself available to God for him to use you in whatever way, strength, and capacity he sees fit to use you. Make yourself available. Tell him, God, I'm here for you. Use me how you will for your glory, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We need to make sure we don't let this world drag us down, but we be the shining light on a hill. Jesus said you are. Shine your light so people can see. Spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, strength isn't enough. This kind of task requires great love. Love. Love for God and love for people who've strayed so far from him, they're worshiping and chasing after false gods, false idols, false prophets. You know, Elijah's words still strike a chord today. They remind us to stop wavering between two opinions. To stop straddling the line when it comes to living our faith in a world that is so often hostile to it. It's going to get worse. We're going to be hated for the name of Jesus. He told us. It's kind of like when he told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. You know, you might as well accept it at that point. If Jesus says it, it's going to happen. He said the world would hate us because of his name. Prepare for that. Get ready for it. We need to thank God for hearing our prayers. We need to confess any tendency to believe that your prayers won't make a real difference in this world and ask God to show you how to pray for the things that he has promised his people. Jesus told us in Matthew 13, 25 that there are tares among the wheat. He said, but while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. You know, Satan has been constantly, secretly infiltrating the church with some of his followers for the purpose of hindering the influence of the church. This is a more effective strategy than direct opposition. I mean, these tares that are spoken of refer to the, the old world variety of, of Darnell, which is poisonous. Okay, I, I grew up on a farm. I, I know a lot about farming. You know, most of the grains are pretty much indistinguishable when they're small, when they're green, just shooting up out of the ground. But by the time they become distinguishable, these tares are so well-rooted and, and growing in such close proximity to the productive grain, whatever it is, wheat, oats, barley, 
Uh, in this case, it's wheat. But if you were to pull up the tares, you would also uproot the wheat. So, verse 30, Jesus told them to let them both grow together until the harvest. You know, the grains of the tares are, are long and black in contrast to the wheat, which is easily recognizable at harvest time. There's a lot of professed Christians say they're Christians, but Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. There will be those who are deceived and not even aware that they're not born again. And they'll remain among the church. And Jesus tells us, he, he warns us against trying to root them out, especially since it's not possible to discern other people's hearts. You know, in an effort to destroy the tares, we might offend one of Christ's little ones and cause their profession of faith to waver. So we have to be very careful. It's important, though, for our own personal benefit that we be aware that the children of the wicked one are placed among the true believers of Christ. In most of the parables Jesus spoke of, the birds of the air, which represent Satan, were there. The birds of the air came and took the seed that was sown along the path. You know, the, there were birds in the mustard seed. Satan has always placed his own within the church. Our best defense is to preach the word of God without watering it down, without being afraid of who you're going to offend with it. You know, false brethren will not endure sound doctrine. They leave when the word is spoken. The word that's sharper than any two-edged sword, it begins to expose their thoughts and the intents of their heart. So stick to the word. Stick to the word, the Holy Bible. It's our defense against Satan himself. It's all we need to defend our faith, to share the good news of the gospel of Christ with others, and to stand strong on the promises that God tells us in his word. It is living and breathing and sharper than any two-edged sword. Listen, you guys have a great weekend. Go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Take somebody with you. I hope and pray you have a great weekend. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday. I love you guys. Take care.